Unit 2-5. Focus. Listen to part of a talk in a geography class. Each biome is characterized chiefly by the dominant forms of plant life and the prevailing climate. The largest biome on Earth is the taiga. The taiga, also known as boreal or evergreen forest, is a broad band across North America, Europe, and Asia. Winters are long and cold, and summers are short, wet, and sometimes warm. Precipitation here is mostly in the form of snow. Moving northward, we have the Arctic tundra here, which extends northward from the taiga and circles the North Pole. The tundra is the northernmost um, limit for plants to grow. The vegetation is most the vegetation is mostly a sort of shrubby, low, mat-like plant forms, and about 20% of Earth's land surface is tundra. We also have alpine tundra, a biome found on high mountaintops. Alpine tundra occurs in all latitudes. That means even in the tropics. Anywhere the elevation is high enough. Here, above the tree line, strong winds and cold temperatures create plant communities similar to those of the Arctic tundra. Match each biome with the correct description. Exercise 2-5, question 1. Listen to a musicologist talk about drums. Drums can be divided according to shape. Some of the types are tubular, vessel, and frame drums. One of the most common tubular drums is the long drum. A lot of long drums are cylindrical. They have the same diameter from top to bottom, like this Polynesian drum. This drum was carved from a length of tree trunk and has a single skin head. For vessel drums, we have the kettle drum. Kettle drums have a single membrane stretched over a pot or vessel body. Vessel drums come in a variety of sizes, from the very large drums of Africa to the very compact and portable drums, like this one from Hawaii. The third type I want you to see is the frame. The third type I want you to see is the frame drum. A frame drum consists of one or two membranes stretched over a simple frame, which is usually made of thin wood. The frame is shallow which adds little resonance when the skin is beaten. A lot of frame drums, like this Turkish tar, have metal jingles attached to the rim. Match each type of drum with the correct picture. Questions 2 through 3. Listen to a biology professor talk about caves. The interior of a cave is divided into three zones. The entrance zone may serve as a place of shelter for animals or people. Prehistoric humans used entrance zones of caves as shelters and burial grounds. Therefore, such zones are of interest to archaeologists, as they provide clues to the habitat of early human beings. The next zone is called the Twilight Zone. The twilight zone is sheltered from direct sunlight and is home to a large, diverse population of animals, such as salamanders, bats, and during severe winters, bears. The third zone, the dark zone, is the true cave environment. Perpetually dark, it has only slight seasonal changes in temperature, few if any air currents, and a constant relative humidity of nearly 100%. In the dark zone live animals that have adapted to the world of darkness, including small shrimp, beetles, spiders, and fish. These animals are usually blind, and some lack eyes altogether. Since no green plants grow in caves, these animals depend largely on food that is washed in by streams or mud. Number 2. Which creatures have lived in each cave zone? Number 3. Indicate whether each item below characterizes the dark zone of a cave. Question 
Questions 4 through 5. Listen to a psychology professor talk about personality types. The theory of personality types suggests there are pairs of what are known as type preferences. Type preferences are not the same as character traits that can be worked on and changed. Rather, they're preferred ways of being in the world, different um, different ways of uh, experiencing daily life. One well-known pair of type preferences is extroversion-introversion. Some people are extroverts and some are introverts. Extroverted people are by nature continuously aware of events outside of themselves. Extroverts turn outward to the world around them to pick up uh, ideas, values, and interests. Extroverts, therefore, usually have a variety of interests and sort of take an active approach to life. Introversion is just the opposite. Introverts look inward for resources. Introverts pursue fewer interests, but on a much deeper level. They sort of take a reflective approach to life. What I mean is they involve themselves in inner events, ideas, and impressions. Introverted people usually prefer to learn in private, individual ways. Number four. Indicate whether each phrase below describes an extrovert or an introvert. Number five, what type of assignment would an introverted student probably prefer? Questions six through ten. Listen to a talk given by an economics instructor. One of the major problems in our economy is inflation, a situation in which prices are going up faster than wages. Thus, a person has to work more hours to pay for the same items. For example, let's say that this year a loaf of bread costs $1, and the average salary in the United States is $10 per hour. That means a person could earn enough money to buy a loaf of bread in one-tenth of an hour or six minutes. Then, halfway through the year, the price of the bread goes up to $1.25, while wages stay the same. That means that a person now has to work one-eighth of an hour, seven and a half minutes, to buy the same loaf of bread. Now let's say that at the end of the year, wages go up to $11 per hour, but the price of bread goes up to $1.50. Now a person has to work more than one-seventh of an hour, over eight minutes, to buy the same loaf of bread. As you can see, if more and more work time is spent earning money to buy loaves of bread, employees will have less money left over to buy other things. Inflation means that the same money buys fewer things, and everybody's standard of living goes down, even if salaries are going up. Some kinds of inflation are worse than others. Moderate inflation does not distort relative prices or incomes severely. Galloping inflation happens rapidly, say at a rate of 100% or more within a year. And then there is hyperinflation, inflation so severe that people try to get rid of their currency before prices rise further and render the money worthless. Times of hyperinflation are usually characterized by social and political turmoil. Number six. What is the main purpose of the talk? Number seven, why does the instructor talk about a loaf of bread? Number eight, what happens when prices go up but salaries remain the same? Numbers 9 and 10. Based on the information in the talk, indicate whether each sentence below describes moderate inflation, galloping inflation, or hyperinflation. Exercise 2 5 1 through 5. 
Listen to a career counselor talk about two different types of employees. Are you going to be more effective and happy as a specialist or as a generalist? Do you find real satisfaction in the precision, order, and system of a clearly laid out job? Or are you one of those people who tend to grow impatient with anything that looks like a routine job? There are a great many careers in which the emphasis is on specialization. You find these careers in engineering and in accounting, in production, in statistical work, and in teaching. But there is an increasing demand for people who are able to take in a great area at a glance. There is, in other words, a demand for people who are capable of seeing the forest rather than the trees, of making overall judgments, of making overall judgments. And these generalists are particularly needed for administrative positions, where it is their job to see that other people do the work, where they have to plan for other people, to organize other people's work, to initiate it and appraise it. Specialists understand one field. Their concern is with technique, tools, media. They are trained people, and their educational background is technical or professional. Generalists, and especially administrators, deal with people. Their concern is with leadership, with planning, with direction, and with coordination. They are educated people, and the humanities are their strongest foundation. Any organization needs both kinds of people, although different organizations need them in different ratios. It is your job to find out during your college years into which of these two job categories you fit, and to plan your career accordingly. Number one, what is the purpose of the talk? Number two, according to the speaker, which people are likely to be specialists? Number three, based on the information in the talk, indicate whether each characteristic below more accurately describes a specialist or a generalist. Number four, according to the speaker, why are generalists needed in administrative positions? Number five, what can be inferred from the talk? Questions 6 through 10. Listen to part of a talk in a botany class. There are several common leaf arrangements in wildflowers. In the usual arrangement, the one called alternate, each leaf is attached at a different level on the stem. This poppy is a good example. See how uh, there's a leaf here on the right side, and above that a leaf on the left here, and above that one on the right again and so on, alternating right and left all the way up the stem. Another type is the opposite arrangement. Notice the difference between the alternate leaves on the poppy and the opposite leaves on this bee plant. The bee plant's leaves are paired on opposite sides of the stem. See how they're attached at the same level of the stem, but on opposite sides. And here we have yet another kind. This one's called basal. And our example is the amaryllis. Notice how all the leaves are at ground level at the stem's base. The amaryllis, this particular plant, and all other members of the amaryllis family, uh, it has narrow basal leaves and a long leafless stalk. I have some lovely samples to share with you today. I'd like you all to come up and examine the contents of uh, these two tables Many of them are specimens of the sunflower family, which includes several species with alternate and opposite leaves. Take a good look and see if you can identify the three types of arrangements. It's okay to handle, but uh, let me ask you to please handle with care, as some of them are quite delicate. 
Number six. How does the instructor organize the information that she presents? Number seven. Select the drawing that best shows the alternate leaf arrangement. Numbers eight and nine. Based on the information in the talk, indicate whether each sentence below describes the alternate, opposite, or basal leaf arrangement. Number ten. What will the students probably do next? Unit two six. Yes. Focus. Listen to part of a talk in a film class. The part of filmmaking that most people know about is the production phase, when the film is actually being shot. But a lot of the real work is done before and after the filming. The film's producers are in charge of the whole project. The producer hires a director to make the creative decisions. The producer and the director work together to plan the film. They hire writers to develop a script for the film. Then, from the script comes the storyboard, an important step in the planning. The storyboard is like a picture book, with a small picture for each camera shot. Under each picture, there's a summary of the action and sometimes a bit of di- action and sometimes a bit of dialogue. Then comes the production when the filming takes place. During production, the director and crew concentrate on getting the perfect camera shot. The director may ask for several takes of the same shot, sometimes changing the script for each take. After the filming is done, there's still a lot to do. This is the post-production phase and includes editing the film. The editor's job is to cut up the various film sequences and then put them together in the right order so the story is told in the best way. The editor works closely with the director as well as various artists and technicians. This is when the sound and special effects are added. The final result being the finished movie you see in the theater. The professor explains how a film is made. Summarize the process by putting the steps in the correct order. Exercise two six a through two. Listen to part of a talk in an art class. If you are unsure of drawing directly in pen and ink, start off with a light pencil sketch. This will allow you to make sure that your proportions are correct and that you are happy with the composition. Take a few minutes to study your subject, this chair and violin. Notice how the straight lines of the chair differ from the curves of the violin. Once you are ready to begin drawing, define the shape of the chair with clean straight lines. Then add contrast by drawing the outline of the violin with gently curved lines. You may have to apply more pressure to the nib when drawing curved lines to allow the ink to flow easily. When you have drawn the outlines of both objects, in the outlines of both objects, add in the finer details, such as the seat of the chair and the violin strings. Suggest the texture of the woven seat by using light and dark strokes of the pen. Number one. What is the purpose of the talk? Number two, the instructor briefly explains how to draw the subject. Indicate whether each sentence below is a step in the process. Questions three through five. Listen to a geography professor talk about avalanche control. Avalanches are a constant threat on mountain highways. 
The Rogers Pass stretch of the Trans-Canada is at risk of being buried in snow from November to April every year. This is why the highway now has a sophisticated defense system. The best way, uh, it's important to control an avalanche when it's small, so a slide is set off while it's still small before it builds up into a serious danger. A team of snow technicians monitors the snowpack. They sort of read the snow and try to predict when it's likely to slide. They study data from the weather stations in the mountains. As the danger increases, they drop explosives onto test slopes to see if the snow can be made to slide. It's kind of tricky trying to decide just when the snow will slide. The weight of the snow, together with the force of gravity, is what starts an avalanche. The technicians don't want to wait till it's too late, but if they're too early, before conditions are just right, the snow won't release. When the time is right, they close the road and remove all traffic from the pass. Most closures last two to four hours. Then the army comes in. A 10-man artillery crew operates a mobile 105-millimeter howitzer, firing shells into the slopes. This sends out shock waves that trigger the avalanches. Slides are set off one by one. The technicians direct the action, telling the troops where to aim the gun. Visibility can be awful. Then they have to check and see if the avalanche has released well enough. Sometimes they drive their trucks below the slide path, kind of dangerous work, and they listen to the snow come down. Sometimes, if the slide is bigger than they expected, they might have to make a speedy getaway. Number three. According to the professor, why is it important to control an avalanche when it is small? Number four. What are the natural causes of an avalanche? Number five. The professor explains how a controlled avalanche is achieved. Summarize the process by putting the steps in the correct order. Questions six through ten. Listen to a discussion in an ecology class. The class is talking about the salmon's run. Various species of Pacific salmon make a round trip from the small streams where they are born to the sea, and then back to the stream of their origin, where they spawn and die. This round trip is known as the salmon's run. The end of the salmon's run is the beginning of the next generation. Pacific salmon hatch in the headwaters of a stream. As fry, the fish then migrate downstream via rivers and eventually to the ocean, where they require several years to mature. While in the sea, salmon from many river systems school and feed together. When mature, the salmon form into groups of common geographic origin and migrate back toward the river they emerged from as juveniles. Is it true that they find their way home by their sense of smell? During the first stage of their return, they navigate by the position of the sun. But later, when they reach the river leading to their home stream, their keen sense of smell takes over. Just what is it they can smell? The other fish? The water flowing from each stream carries a unique scent. This scent comes from the types of plants, soil, and other components of that stream. This scent is apparently imprinted in the memory of a salmon fry before it migrates to the sea. I remember having a real shock when I was hiking once. I was looking at a waterfall, and I saw a salmon jump up about ten feet. At first, I couldn't believe my eyes, but then I saw another one do it, and then several more. It was an awesome sight. They must have an incredibly powerful instinct. The survival of their species depends on their ability to get home and reproduce. And of course, other species depend on the survival of the salmon. Salmon provide an important link in the food chain. They spend 90% of their lives in the ocean, where they feed on plankton, shrimp, and small fish. When they make their return journey, they carry nutrients from the ocean back to the rivers and streams. Up north, where I used to live in the river valley. 
The eagles would gather for the salmon run every year. They'd gorge themselves on all the salmon that had just spawned. Nothing is wasted in nature. After the salmon spawn, their carcasses feed birds, mammals, and vegetation, and even their own newly hatched offspring. Number six, the professor explains what happens during the salmon's run. Indicate whether each sentence below is a step in the process. Number seven. How do salmon find their way to their home stream? Number eight. Listen again to part of the discussion, then answer the question. I remember having a real shock when I was hiking once. I was looking at a waterfall. And I saw a salmon jump up about ten feet. At first, I couldn't believe my eyes, but then I saw another one do it, and then several more. It was an awesome sight. Why does the student say this? At first, I couldn't believe my eyes. Number nine. According to the professor, why are salmon an important link in the food chain? Number ten. What can be concluded from this statement? Nothing is wasted in nature. After the salmon spawn, their carcasses feed birds, mammals, and vegetation. And even their own newly hatched offspring. Exercise two six one through three. Listen to part of a lecture in a botany class. The professor is discussing photosynthesis. The complex process inside a leaf takes energy from the sun. And uses it to convert water and carbon dioxide into sugars. During this process, photosynthesis, plants convert light energy into chemical energy. All leaves carry out photosynthesis in basically the same way. First, the pores on the leaf's outer skin open up and take in molecules of carbon dioxide. Water absorbed by the roots is transported upward through the plant. And it enters the leaf through its stem. Carbon dioxide and water—these are the raw materials for photosynthesis. These are the raw materials for photosynthesis. Once carbon dioxide and water are present, photosynthesis can begin. The chemical reactions of photosynthesis take place in two stages: the light-dependent reactions and the light-independent reactions. When sunlight shines on a leaf during the light-dependent stage, its energy is absorbed by molecules of chlorophyll, which you all know is the pigment giving a leaf its green color. The light energy absorbed by the chlorophyll is used to split the hydrogen and oxygen in the water. Then, during the light-independent reactions, hydrogen from the water combines with carbon dioxide. And forms carbohydrates, including the sugar glucose, but also other molecules that are rich in food energy for the plant. In the process, excess oxygen is released to the outside air through the leaf's pores. Finally, the plant transports the products of photosynthesis. Microscopic veins in the leaf carry the food out through the stem and into the cells of the plant. This process continues all throughout the growing season. That is, as long as the leaves remain green. Number one. Which of the following best describes the organization of the lecture? Number two. 
What must be present for photosynthesis to begin? Number 3. The professor briefly explains what happens during photosynthesis. Indicate whether each sentence below is a step in the process. Questions 4 through 7. Listen to part of a lecture in a psychology class. The professor is talking about stating laws in the science of psychology. Psychology is a relatively new science. Like other sciences, psychology must be able to state laws. A law is a way of organizing knowledge about something so that we can make predictions. When enough knowledge is gained about a subject, a scientist can state precisely what will happen under certain conditions. We experimental psychologists are interested in developing laws about human behavior, so we'll be able to understand and predict what people do and why they do it. Of course, to develop laws about human behavior, we must assume there's some regularity to it. We can't be psychologists without making the assumption that behavior follows certain patterns. One of the major laws psychologists have discovered is called the law of effect. The law of effect states that whether or not a person will repeat a behavior depends on the effect that behavior has. If an action is rewarded, it's likely to be repeated. If the action is not rewarded or if it's punished, it's not likely to be repeated. How do psychologists state laws? First, using available knowledge, a psychologist makes a hypothesis about behavior. Then, the psychologist tests the hypothesis through an experiment. But even if the experiment proves the hypothesis was correct, it's not yet a law. It's just the beginning of the work. To arrive at a law that will apply to all humans, many repetitions of the experiment must be conducted under different conditions. Only repeated verification, especially proof that the behavior can be predicted, will result in a law. Number four. According to the professor, why are psychologists interested in developing laws? Number five. According to the professor, what assumption do psychologists make? Number six, which behavior illustrates the law of effect? Number seven, the professor explains how psychologists develop laws. Summarize the process by putting the steps in the correct order. Questions 8 through 10. Listen to part of a lecture in a biology class. There are lots of different wetlands, from marshes to swamps to bogs. The flow of water through a wetland determines the types of plants that grow there. A marsh is a wetland where the soil is regularly or permanently saturated with water. Because of the continuous presence of water, marshes usually don't contain trees or shrubs. Marsh vegetation is usually soft-stemmed or herbaceous, for example, grasses, sedges, and mosses. Wetlands are among the richest of all biomes. Animal life is highly diverse and includes an array of insects, amphibians, reptiles, and birds. Because marshes are so biologically productive, an abundance of dead plant and animal material, energy-rich organic matter, enters the food chain each year. And much of this energy-rich biomass is broken down by bacteria and water fungi. The water in marshes may become tea-colored or dark brown because of the organic acids from the decaying vegetation. In the past, humans have viewed these marshes and most wetlands 
as the source of mosquitoes, bad odors, and disease. Humans have destroyed a lot of wetlands, mostly to make way for agricultural development. Now, however, we recognize the ecological importance of wetlands, and we're putting a lot of research into figuring out how wetlands can be restored. Number eight. According to the professor, which type of vegetation grows in marshes? Number nine. The professor briefly describes a biological process that occurs in a marsh. Indicate whether each sentence below is a step in the process. Number 10. Why have so many wetlands been destroyed? Quiz 6. Listen to part of a talk in a marine biology class. An ocean's waters are not the same all the way through. They are divided up like a building with several stories where life is very different at the top, middle, and bottom stories. The upper layer of the ocean is warmer than the layers underneath. The clear, sunlit waters near the surface are an ideal place for the microscopic plants called plankton to grow. The tiny plant plankton provides food for tiny animal plankton, and so they start off the food chain for everything else in the sea. Huge schools of fish like herring and sardines cruise the upper waters to eat the animal plankton. Big fast swimming fish like tuna and swordfish swim through the same levels swordfish swim through the same levels to capture the smaller fish. About two hundred meters below the surface the temperature suddenly drops. This is a dimly lit twilight world. From there to the ocean's bottom it is very cold. Utter darkness usually begins at a depth of one thousand meters. Down in the bottom zone, no plants can survive, and all that can be found there are animals hunting and feeding on other animals. Number one. According to the professor, what characterizes the ocean's upper zone? Number two. The professor briefly describes the ocean's food chain. Indicate whether each sentence below is a step in the process. Number three. How does the professor describe each layer of the ocean's waters? Questions 4 through 6. Listen to part of a talk in a zoology class. The professor is talking about bees. The worker bees, underdeveloped females, do all the work that is done in the hive. They secrete the wax, build the comb, gather pollen, feed and rear the brood, and fight all the battles necessary to defend the colony. The worker bees possess the whole ruling power of the colony and regulate its economy. The worker develops from the egg into a perfect adult bee in 21 days. Each egg is laid by the queen bee, who deposits it in the bottom of the worker's cell. After three days, the egg hatches into a small white worm called a larva, which, being fed by the adult bees, increases rapidly in size. When the cell is nearly filled by the growing larva, it is closed up by the bees. The larva then enters the pupa state. When the adult worker emerges from the pupa, she usually does not leave the hive until about eight days later. Then, accompanied by other young workers, she takes her first flight in the warmth of the afternoon. The body of the worker bee is divided into three segments, head, thorax, and abdomen. On the head are the mandibles, 
the jaw-like organs, which enable the bees to perform the necessary hive duties and to mold the wax and build their combs. The honeybee's four wings and six legs are fastened to the thorax. Located in the abdomen are the honey sac and the sting, with its highly developed poison sac. The sting is used by the workers for self-defense and for the protection of their colony. The worker uses her sting only once, for in doing so, she loses her life. Number 4. What tasks does the worker bee perform? Number 5. The professor describes the stages of a worker bee's development. Summarize the process by putting the events in the correct order. Number 6. What segment of the bee's body contains the feature necessary for each activity? Questions 7 through 10. A student is giving an oral report in a world history class. She is talking about bread and cereals. Bread and cereals have a long history. The first bread was made in the Nile Valley about 10,000 years ago. The people used stones to crush the grain into coarse flour, and then they made the flour into primitive forms of bread. Primitive bread was not like the bread we know today because it was simply flour dough dried on heated stones. The invention of ovens came later. Leavened breads and cakes, which are made to rise by the action of yeast, were also a discovery of the ancient Egyptians. The Egyptians were the first people to master the art of baking. News of this new wonder food spread to other places in the Middle East. Soon other people were collecting seed, cultivating land, and inventing ways to turn grain into flour. Baking used to be a social activity. While some homes had their own ovens, many families had to bake their dough in communal bakeries. To identify their loaves, each household would make a distinctive mark on the bread, sometimes with a special stamp bearing the family name. Modern cereals descended from the cereals grown long ago. These grains now supply the world with everything from bread and breakfast cereal to pasta and even candy and beer. The most important grain crop in the temperate regions of the world today is wheat. Bread wheat is the most widely planted variety. The large grains of bread wheat are rich in gluten, a kind of protein, and produce light, airy bread. Another widely cultivated variety of wheat is durum, which goes into making pasta. Other important cereal crops are rye and oats. Rye is the hardiest cereal and is more resistant to cold, pests, and disease than wheat. Oats are grown in temperate regions and are mainly fed to cattle, but the best quality oats are made into oatmeal and other breakfast foods. Number 7. What topics does the speaker discuss? Number 8. The speaker traces the history of bread. Indicate whether each sentence below describes an event in the history. Number 9. Why did people stamp their bread with the family name? Number 10. Based on the information in the talk, indicate whether each phrase below describes wheat or oats. Quiz 7. Listen to a discussion in a music history class. The class is studying improvisation. Every jazz player knows what he or she means by improvisation. 
and all writers know what they mean by improvisation. The result, of course, is a lot of confusion and disagreement about what improvisation really is. We hear about the different types of improvisation, free improvisation and controlled improvisation and collective improvisation. What does it all mean? Yes, Mary? My dictionary says improvise means to compose or recite without preparation. That's true, but it tells us only part of the story. As we know, musicians learn how to play their instruments before they can improv- play their instruments before they can improvise. So they do have some preparation. Yes, Arthur? Maybe a better definition is composing and performing at the same time. That tells us another part of the story. Let's try to understand it more by looking at history. Improvisation is as old as music itself. In the beginning, music was largely improvisational, supplied on the spur of the moment by prehistoric people who made music for work, play, war, love, worship, and so on. Music was not separate from everyday life. Rather, music was a force that communicated the relationship of people to nature and people to each other. Two thousand years ago, the practice of improvisation was widespread among the ancient Greeks. The Greeks based their improvisations on what we might call stock melodies, a collection of tunes known by all musicians. In 16th century Italy, organists had contests for improvising. The ability to improvise in a fugal style, several melodies going at the same time, was a standard requirement for all appointments to organ positions. So these cutting contests were like job interviews. Didn't some of the early jazz musicians have those kinds of contests too? Actually, the early jazz musicians were very similar to the ancient Greeks in that they were making a music partly their own and partly derived from the stock melodies in their environment. In most cases, black musicians improvised on the European melodies they heard white bands playing. Were they really just creating music without any preparation except hearing other musicians? I'm glad you asked that, Mary. There were a number of musicians who'd played in army bands, and they had training of one kind or another. It was these trained military bandsmen who were responsible for the rise of jazz improvisation. Number one. Why is improvisation difficult to define? Number two. How does the professor develop the topic of improvisation? Number three. Who first improvised when playing music? Number four. Based on the information in the discussion, indicate whether each phrase below describes prehistoric humans or jazz musicians. Number five. What does the professor imply about early jazz improvisation? Questions 6 through 10. A professor of education is giving a lecture about child development. Listen to part of the lecture. In some ways, mental development is related to social development in school aged children. Between the ages of 6 and 12, children move from being able to think only on a concrete level, that is, about real objects they can touch, to being capable of abstract thought. In their social development, Children gradually acquire interpersonal reasoning skills. They learn to understand the feelings of other people and also learn that a person's actions or words don't always reflect their inner feelings. When children first start school, at around four to six years old, they can focus on only one thought at a time. 
Socially, they can understand only their own perspective and don't yet understand that other people may see the same event differently from the way they see it. They don't reflect on the thoughts of others. What I mean is, children at this age are self-centered, and for this reason it's known as the egocentric stage of social development. Children 6 to 10 years old solve problems by sort of generalizing from their own experiences. What I mean is, they can understand only what they've experienced for themselves. They can't think theoretically or abstractly. They have to handle real objects in order to solve problems. But socially, children are learning to distinguish between the way they understand social interactions and how other people interpret them. From 10 to 12 years old, children's mental processes are still sort of tied to direct experience. But on a social level, children can now understand actions as an outsider might see them. This permits children to understand the expectations people have of them in a variety of situations. Children can now manage various social roles. For example, son or daughter, older or younger brother or sister, fifth grader, classmate, friend, teammate, and so on. Because they can play multiple roles, this stage is known as the multiple role-taking stage. Beginning around age 12, children can start dealing with abstractions. What I mean is, they can form hypotheses, solve problems systematically, and not have to handle real objects. And the social perspective is also expanding, because in this stage, children can now take a more analytical view of their own behavior, as well as the behavior of other people. Sometime between 12 and 15 years old, a societal perspective begins to develop. I mean, the young teenager is now able to judge actions by how they might influence all individuals, not just the people who are immediately concerned. Number 6. What is the main idea of the lecture? Number 7. At what age is a child least able to recognize the thoughts of other people? Number 8. Listen again to part of the lecture. Then answer the question. Children 6 to 10 years old solve problems by sort of generalizing from their own experiences. What I mean is, they can understand only what they've experienced for themselves. They can't think theoretically or abstractly. They have to handle real objects in order to solve problems. Why does the professor say this? They have to handle real objects in order to solve problems. Number 9. What can be inferred about children in the multiple role-taking stage? Number 10. The professor briefly explains the stages of social development in children. Indicate whether each sentence below is a stage in the process. Quiz 8. Listen to a conversation between a student and a professor. Dr. Zarelli? Hello, Karen. How are you? Pretty good, thanks. I was hoping um, we could talk about the project that's due at the end of May. Of course. What can I do for you? Well, the project plan, that part's due next week, right? Uh, I, I believe that's right. Let me look at the syllabus. I tend to forget dates unless I have them right in front of me. Ah, yes, that's right. The first due date. The project plan is due next week on Monday, May 3rd. I'm a little... I'm not sure about what you want. Do you just... What exactly should the plan look like? Well, a description. A summary of your project. 
a short description of the topic and a summary of your materials and methods and what materials and methods and what you hope to accomplish. I have an idea. Um, it's something that interests me, but I'm not sure if I don't know whether it fits the assignment. It's not about marketing as much as it has more to do with social change. Let's try it on for size. Tell me your idea. Well, my boss. I work part time at a credit union, and my boss is a person who's done a lot of different things. She used to be the president of an organization that helped set up cooperatives for women artisans in India. They make clothes mostly and things like tablecloths and toys. She's really interesting, my boss, I mean, and so are the stories about her work. I guess you could say she works for economic development, but also for social change because it's work that affects women and their role in society. Can you tell me more about the organization? Sure, they're called Hearts and Hands. I looked at their website. They have a motto: "Changing Views, Changing Lives." And their mission statement is to empower artisans by providing economic opportunities and exposure to new ideas. My boss was the president for five years, and she's still on their board of directors. Hmm. And what would you like to do with all this? Well, I'd like to interview my boss—a more formal interview—and write about her work with Hearts and Hands. Okay, and I could do a case study about a group that works for both economic and social change. I could combine the interview data with information from their website. It would also be a good idea to link some of your findings with the theories and models we've discussed in class. Oh, like for example, their product catalog. They have a printed catalog, and it's also online. Great idea! You could include an analysis and evaluation of their catalog. I have to say, Karen, you've got a fairly solid plan here. Your idea of a case study of an economic development organization is a good one, and it fits right in with our course content. All you need to do now is put down your plan on paper. Really? I'm so glad to hear you say that. I'll do it then. I'll write it up for next week. Thank you, Dr. Zarelli. You've been a great help. It's my pleasure. Glad you stopped by. Number one. Why does the woman go see her professor? Number two. When is the project plan due? Number three. Listen again to part of the conversation, then answer the question. I'm a little. I'm not sure about what you want. Do you just? What exactly should the plan look like? Select the sentence that best expresses how the woman probably feels. Number four. What topics will the woman write about? Number five. What information will the woman include in her project? Questions six through ten. Listen to a talk in a geology class. The professor is discussing rock formations. Now that you know how sedimentary rocks are formed. The next step is to look at various shapes and learn to read them. On our next field trip, we'll see several of the formations called mesas. This landform gets its name from its flat top. Mesa means table in Spanish. The Spanish people who explored the area thought these flat-topped hills looked sort of like tables. A mesa is wider than it is high, kind of like a large table. We'll also see a variety of other formations. Such as buttes, spires, and pillars. All of these spectacular forms are the result of the erosion of rocks of differing hardness. Water erodes rocks both mechanically and chemically. The fast-moving water of rivers carries silt, gravel, and rock debris, and this scours the rock underneath. Slow-moving, standing water also erodes when it enters tiny rock pores and dissolves the cements holding the rock together. 
On a mesa, conditions are optimal for erosion. With enough time, even the durable top of a mesa will decrease in size. The sides of a mesa are often made of shale or softer sandstone. The slope of the sides will increase the water's speed and force as it runs down. Freezing and thawing loosen the surface rock. Debris carried by the running water cuts away the softer surface rock. As the softer base of the mesa recedes, the edge of the top is weakened, and it eventually cracks, splits, and falls. As a mesa is shrunk in size by water, it may be cut into smaller landforms. If these smaller remnants are at least as high as they are wide, they are called buttes. The great buttes we'll see were all created by water rather than wind erosion. Further erosion can change a butte into a tower or spire. This is because the shaft of the spire is usually harder than the base on which it stands, and, and like a mesa or butte, it's capped with a rim of even harder rock. The spires you'll see were left standing after the sandstone around them eroded away. You can see why they're also called chimneys. I mean, they sort of jut up from the sandstone floor. Further erosion of the softer rock may reduce the spire to some interesting and really weird forms. We'll see some hourglass-shaped rocks, mushroom-shaped rocks, and a sort of strangely eroded pillar. Over time, erosion finally topples these rocks to the ground. They might remain there as boulders, or they might undergo further erosion that completely demolishes them, so they disintegrate into pebbles. Finally, these pebbles end up as the sand we walk on as we explore the surface of the plateau. Number six, which picture represents a mesa? Number seven, what reasons are given for the erosion of a mesa? Number eight. Listen again to part of the talk, then answer the question. The spires you'll see were left standing after the sandstone around them eroded away. You can see why they're also called chimneys. I mean, they sort of jut up from the sandstone floor. Why does the professor say this? I mean, they sort of jut up from the sandstone floor. Number nine. The professor briefly explains how erosion changes landforms. Summarize the process by putting the stages in the correct order. Number ten. What can be concluded about erosion?